to worship on the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany and the second Sunday of Black History Month. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. The Collect of the Day. Almighty and ever-living God, whose Son Jesus Christ healed the sick and restored them to wholeness of life, look with compassion on the anguish of the world and by your power make whole all peoples and nations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And a collect for Black History Month. Let's say this together. Compassionate God, who sent Jesus Christ to deliver us from all manner of injustices and inequalities, create in us new hearts and enlarge visions to see the image of God in every person, irrespective of background, race, and ethnicity. May we be generous in our love of others as we work towards ending misunderstanding, racism, and injustice, creating communities of human flourishing through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 30, reading from verse 15 to 20. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. This reading is taken from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. And so, brothers and sisters, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul and another, I belong to Apollos. Are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, working together. 
You are God's field, God's building. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or a sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or a sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, if you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The Gospel of Christ. Lord, we're all standing here now with open hearts and minds. We're listening carefully to your spirit. Now, Lord, we ask that you speak to us. Speak through my words. Speak through our thoughts and feelings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm sure that none of you here are old enough to know this, but back in the early part of the 20th century, in the days of radio, there used to be a very famous children's broadcaster in the United States. His name was Uncle Don. Maybe you've heard the name, even if you haven't heard his broadcasts. And even up here in Canada, children would listen in whenever Uncle Don was on the air. Uh, he used to hold children mesmerized. And one night, he had just finished his broadcast he had told his last story to the children, millions of them across the continent, and he sang his familiar sign-off song. 
And then, as the station went to commercial break, he leaned back in his chair and he sighed and said, well, that ought to keep the little dot, dot, dot <laughs> satisfied. If you need to know what that word is, I will tell you privately in my office afterwards, but you can guess. Unfortunately, the engineer of the station was late in cutting to station break. And the disparaging remark was heard by millions of children across the United States and some parts of Canada. The station, as you can imagine, was immediately flooded by thousands of telegrams from outraged parents. And very quickly, the station manager made the decision to fire poor Uncle Don. That was it. He never was able to broadcast again. And according to the stories, I don't know how true they are, he died a drunk and destitute. Now, over the years, this story has kind of evolved into an urban myth. And across America and Canada, a lot of people will tell the story, but they will attach their local children's broadcaster's name to it. So it might be Bozo the Clown, or uh, Mr. Dress Up, any number of children's broadcasters have been unfairly plastered with this story. That's the way that urban myths are. They just kind of mutate and spread. But whether or not um, your local children's broadcaster that you listen to ever did such a thing, uh, it did shock people in that time because they thought that he was on the basis of his outer appearance and the way that he projected himself on the radio, they thought he was one kind of a man, but it turned out that on the inside, he was quite different, even had a callous disregard for children. Now that happens all the time, doesn't it? And in this day and age of media, and instant information that we're being bombarded with all the time. We hear all kinds of stories. For instance, and some of them are, I, I find are, are sad. Sad that these things happened at all. Sad that we've lost some of the icons that we used to admire so much. Like Michael Jackson. Nobody can dance like Michael Jackson. Fred Astaire once said when he was asked who would his successor be? He said, Michael Jackson, no doubt. And yet, he fell into disfavor because of the lifestyle that he chose to live privately. Another was Bill Cosby. Now, it's hard for us to imagine what an impact that made on people when he fell from grace because many children, especially African-American children, had shaped their life's plans around what Bill Cosby showed them on his television show. He was a medical doctor. He was a good father and a family man, and he provided a role model to countless children. But then it turned out the real person behind the mask was quite different. Bill Clinton, and you know, you could go on with a list of people uh, who are very similar. People that we thought were one way on the basis of their outer appearance, but turned out to be something quite different inside. And when that happens, when these revelations occur, we feel frustrated. Some people feel angry and judgmental, other people simply feel sad. I think I'm in the latter category. We've lost so many wonderful people, talented people, uh, who have just fallen into disfavor because of the lives that they chose to live. This past week, just a couple of days ago, we heard an announcement from our mayor 
saying that he was stepping down, that he was resigning from office. Now the thing to remember about John Tory is that when he uh, campaigned originally, a major plank on his platform was, I'm not Rob Ford. You're not going to have a scandal every day. I'm not going to get up and have to apologize for my <laughs> private behavior all the time. Because the man that you see sitting there in his office at City Hall is the same man that I am in private. And then he had to get up just like Rob Ford used to and make a confession about his private life. Again, I, I don't feel any judgment at all. I, I feel sad for his family, of course, for his wife, all those affected for the city of Toronto. I feel sad for him because this kind of thing is always happening around us. And Jesus understood this. This is the thing, I, no matter how people argue, pro or con, when they're talking about the Christian faith or about Jesus, what I always respond to them with is, you know, no matter what you think Jesus was, whether he's a son of God or not, whether he was divine or merely human, however you want to define Jesus, he was the most brilliant, far-sighted, understanding man that ever lived. 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, when no one else was saying this, Jesus said, what goes on inside of you is just as important as what goes on on the outside. And that's what he's talking about here in this fragment of the Sermon on the Mount that was read by Rosalind this morning. And I know when I was younger, I never understood this. I always thought, come on, you, you can't be serious, where Jesus says, you shall not, you have heard it said in ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. Imagine everyone in the crowd nodding their heads. Yes, we've heard that, of course. And then Jesus goes on to say, but I say to you that if you're angry, with your brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be a liable to the council. Well, how can that be? When I was younger, I used to think, so Jesus, God is mind reading, he's looking into our minds, and if we just have a fleeting thought where we're angry at somebody else, it's the same as if we have murdered them, come on. Of course, murdering somebody is much more serious. And he says something very similar, similar principle, a little bit later on where he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, the penalty for adultery in the Old Testament is clear stoned to death. You remember the woman that was caught in adultery? And Jesus had to step between her persecutors and her and say, you know, he who is without the first, without sin, cast the first stone. This was commonplace, just as it is in uh, parts of the uh, conservative Muslim world today. People who are com commit adultery, this is the penalty. But Jesus is saying here, you just have to have a lustful thought. Well, if that's the case, then most men I know, <laughs> in fact, I would say all men that I know <laughs> are done for. <laughs> and I only speak for mankind here, but I'll let the women speak for themselves. That may well be the case with women as well. Uh, lust is just a part of growing up. <laughs> it may take quite a while, if ever, to shake off for some people. But Jesus is saying here that just to have these feelings, even if you don't express them, even if you don't talk about it, it's as if you committed the act. Again, how can that be? 
Surely these are, these are apples and oranges. What you think and feel is not the same as what you do, surely. You remember Jimmy Carter famously said uh, in one of his speeches, he said that he lusted in his heart sometimes. And people were outraged. The President of the United States, an avowed Baptist, <laughs> is saying that he lusts in his heart. But anyone who was honest, of course, would stop and think about it and think, oh yeah, <laughs> that's not just poor Jimmy who was willing to confess it bravely, but it really applies to all of us. So, we've got a real issue here, don't we? If our internal feelings and thoughts are treated on the same level as our actions by God, how do we deal with that? Well, here's what I believe Jesus is saying here. Understanding human nature as he did, he recognized that, for instance, Mayor John Tory didn't one day just do something out of character, but he was acting out of his internal life and his value system within. Um, that Uncle Don, when he made that statement at the end of his broadcast to all the children of America, he was acting from his attitude within. He did very well at hiding it when he thought that he was being heard by millions, but that's how he felt inside. And he would have been the first to say to you, it's harmless. Yeah, sure, I, I get bored and I don't even like the kids quite often that I'm broadcasting to. But so what? I don't do anything about it. I don't disparage them on the air. I'm Uncle Don. But Jesus is saying, the person you are on the inside is going to leak out eventually to the person you are on the outside. Now, some of us do pretty well at bridling our feelings inside. We can get horribly angry at somebody. We can even, in our minds, imagine taking vengeance on them, maybe committing an act of violence if somebody has really hurt us badly. But we always say to ourselves, but I, I would never act upon it. I would never do anything. And, and nobody else has to know how I feel. But this is how I feel, and it's justified. The only trouble is, um, when our will is weakened, for some people it may be by addictions, drugs, alcohol. Other people it may be um, maybe just a highly charged emotional situation that they didn't expect to get into, but it kind of escalated. It's amazing how ordinary folk can commit the most terrible crimes. Have you ever noticed that when somebody does something awful, um, maybe takes out a gun and shoots his family and then himself, something like that, when they go and interview the neighbors in the neighborhood, they all say, he was such a quiet man. He was, he was always nice to his children, played with them in the backyard, and he was part of our community and participated in community events. I can't believe that he did that. Well, that's who does these crimes. It's usually not crazy people or insane people, although that happens a lot too, but it's often ordinary folk who are pushed to the limit. So many of the things that we do in life that we later on regret started out as feelings, thoughts within. And we rationalized them and we thought, they're inside, nobody knows about them, therefore, it's not gonna do anyone any harm. But Jesus is sending out a warning here in this sermon. He's saying, what you feel and what you think about your neighbor does cause harm. Maybe not while it's still locked inside of you, although even then it can tear you apart, 
It can make you unhappy and unsettled and maybe show itself in other ways. But certainly in some cases it will come out in the way that you act towards other people. Jesus is saying then, be really careful about what you think or feel. You can't help feeling lust. You can't help from time to time being angry at your neighbor and all kinds of other negative emotions. But he says what you can do something about is in your heart, in your mind say, no, this is not acceptable. It's not acceptable for me as a healthy, integrated human being. And it can be quite dangerous, possibly, if I were ever pushed to the limit and acted upon what I'm feeling. And so we pray to God, Lord, cleanse my heart. I think of uh, Psalm 51 that we always read uh, on Good Friday, where it says, renew or create, O oh God, a clean heart within me. Renew a right spirit within me. In other words, God, just come in and do some spring cleaning <laughs> because I'm not happy with the way that I am inside and what I feel and think sometimes. I can't change that, but Lord, I ask you to come and renew my heart, cleanse my heart. So Jesus, I believe, saw that as, a great, as one of his great goals for human life. He was always teaching his disciples about this that we be integrated human beings, that our inside and our outside life match and uh, reflect each other, that we not be one person inside, another person on the outside. We all need God to cleanse us within. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
Denise and I would like to make a request. Because I'm, I'm of course going to throw you under with me. <laughs> um, uh, St. Michael's needs to have some representative for the campus, part of what we do, and we're hoping, and don't all just come forward at once, but we're hoping that we can get a volunteer or volunteers to represent our membership on the campus committee. At this time, we're not sure what the responsibilities are going to be, but it will be fun, I guarantee that, because Denise is there and Canada is there. Um, if there's any questions that you would like to have, you can contact either Denise, myself, Waveney, who's, yeah, but Waveney is connected <laughs> while he's drinking his coconut water, but that's okay. So um, we would love to have you guys on board with us. Uh, the meetings are held once a month at this time. We think you'd just be, you know, taking notes and being aware of what's happening between St. John's and St. Mike's. Um, and there, but there may be additional responsibilities. You can bring your talents to the table. I've been so surprised. You never know what comes up on campus and what you might be able to provide to the church. So thank you for your support. Um, I, I just wanted to add that we are short a deputy warden, as you, those of you who were at um, Vestry know. So hence the reason that we are soliciting your help to have an, another voice on campus whereby the wardens, the current wardens, don't have to do everything that is required of a warden to do as a representative of the campus board. So as Rhonda said, we would love to have someone come forward and offer their services, whatever it might be. Um, we're not sure exactly what you may be called upon to do, but it would really help us to have a volunteer so that uh, some of the load of the wardens can be lightened a little bit, okay? So thank you very much, and we look forward to um, getting <coughs> Lots and lots of requests of people wanting to get involved and to help out in this way. Thank you. Okay, just generally, but not necessarily if you, you come on campus. Uh, the chairperson is a responsibility. The treasurer is a responsibility. Um, secretary, someone to take notes. Uh, those are the three main, I believe, uh, responsibilities of campus, but then <coughs> Sometimes um, different problems present themselves and we need somebody to sort of take the rein and run with that. For example, with the, the vault, um, we sometimes need people who would be just responsible for taking one item or one issue that we have on campus and running with it, okay? So, if you are interested, Please see one of us, and if you're interested in one of those positions that I mentioned, then we will certainly fill you in on what the possible responsibilities will be, and you can make your decision as to whether or not you want to undertake that as um, your baby, so to speak, okay? Thanks very much, everyone, and have a wonderful day.